Our next speaker is uh, Jeff Smith. Uh, Jeff has come all the way from North Carolina State University, and he's here to talk about passive immunity in calves stimulated by vaccination for, against salmonella. Thank you. Thank you. So I'll start by saying I'm not really a card-carrying immunologist. I'm a clinician with an interest in calf health, so you won't see any fancy immunology diagrams. I got interested in, in this study several years ago, and I'm just going to share with you sort of two preliminary studies, pilot studies that we've done so far as part of an ongoing program looking at trying to use vaccines in the dry cow to prevent salmonella, diarrhea, or other diseases in the calf. So salmonella in some countries, including the United States, is still a very significant cause of calf mortality. Uh, there are several different serial groups or serial types that exist. I saw some data last week from University of Wisconsin that arguably, perhaps other than Cornell, does the greatest amount of salmonella diagnostics in the United States. So over the last 5,000 isolates spanning several years, salmonella Dublin has been the most common from cattle, about 25% followed by Salmonella cero, C-E-R-R-O, which seems to be an emerging disease or type of Salmonella in the United States. Salmonella Newport, Montevideo, and Typhimerium would be the rest of the sort of top five. But again, the problem is you have multiple different serial groups represented there, multiple different types of Salmonella. So vaccine or vaccination of the calf can be challenging. I'd like to talk about this just for a second. This came, this is almost 40 years old now. This was written up by the late Otto Radistitz as sort of our key principles of disease control for calf diarrhea. And I always think this is really interesting to talk about, particularly at a meeting like this, where we have many high level scientific presentations going on. Really, when you get down to controlling disease in calves, everything we do is aimed at one of these four things. Trying to remove the source of infection from the calf's environment. So we do that by making sure the calf is born into a clean environment, et cetera. We remove the calf from a contaminated environment. Again, that dairy calf, we're trying to get out of that maternity area as quick as we can, make sure it doesn't get exposed to disease. We can try to increase the immunity of the calf, which is what we're focused on here today, and then reduce stress. So when we think about the very sophisticated things that can be done, molecular biology techniques, really when it comes to calf health, everything we do fits in one of these four boxes. So my interest in immunology is really as a tool in the toolbox, number three, trying to increase the immunity of these calves and trying to prevent disease. So in terms of salmonella vaccination, there's a lot of autogenous vaccines sold in the United States. Um, most data would indicate that vaccinating young calves, so newborn calves less than a week of age or two weeks of age, it's not very beneficial. There's lots of studies that would show killed vaccines or autogenous vaccines have not been very effective in that manner. Again, it's a complex problem because we have multiple serial groups of salmonella. Immunity to each one appears to be a little different. If I use a salmonella typhimerium vaccine in a herd that has primarily a Dublin problem, it's not likely to work. Okay. Obviously, when we talk about salmonella control, our most important aspect is to limit exposure to the bacteria. We talked about that on the last slide, some of the things that we try to do. But we have farms that are doing very good jobs with hygiene, yet we still have salmonella. So again, as a clinician, my interest is, how can I help these farms? Is there any way I can use vaccination to try to improve uh, the clinical scenario on the farms? Certainly for other types of calf diarrhea, for rotavirus, for E. coli, there's very good data that the use of what I'll call dry cow vaccines, the use of vaccines in the late pregnant or the cow that's about to go dry, her responding to the vaccine, making antibodies that she puts in her colostrum, there's very good data that shows that that will help, not prevent, but will help prevent disease in calves. So I guess I thought, why couldn't we do that with salmonella? When you look into the literature, there's not much on this. There's a few studies that are older that have uh, been done historically. There was a study done in New Zealand in the mid-60s. They found that vaccinating cows with a killed vaccine reduced shedding in the calves. They gave uh, these calves an oral challenge with typhimerium at two days of age. The paper doesn't report any data on clinical signs, so I don't know if it helped with disease, but there was less salmonella shedding. There was a study done in the UK back in the 80s where if they fed calves colostrum from cows that had been vaccinated for salmonella, they had reduction in mortality, they had shorter fecal shedding. 
Okay, this is a study done in California years ago. This was with a modified live Salmonella vaccine that was actually designed for pigs. So this is a Salmonella cholera suis vaccine. One group of cows got an autogenous, so a killed Salmonella Montevideo vaccine. One group got the swine vaccine, a modified live, and another group got nothing. What they found is the group that had got the modified live vaccine, they, the cows, had reduced fecal shedding of salmonella. This was on a farm that had a lot of salmonella. Also, the calves born to those calves had reduced rates of salmonella shedding. Again, no real mention of disease in this study. So lastly, I'll mention this. This was a study done in Japan where they challenged calves both with salmonella typhimerium and salmonella Dublin. And some of those calves were fed egg yolk antibodies. What they found is the more antibodies you fed these calves, you were able to prevent disease due to salmonella. So certainly we have some evidence that if there's local antibody in the gut, we can prevent or at least reduce the risk of salmonella in these calves. So we've done two studies so far. One was uh, with a vaccine called SRP. So this is a vaccine marketed by Zoetis in the United States. This is a subunit vaccine. So it's based on extracts of siderophore receptors. It's designed on the absolute requirement of the bacteria for iron, so it's going to sequester iron. Um, in this study, we vaccinated 30 Holstein cows at dry off and again four weeks later, so in the middle of the dry period. And then we had another 30 cows that just got saline. This was on a farm that had no history of salmonella. We had pretty extensive culture, fecal culture records, both from calves and cows on this farm, and at least in the previous 10 years had never had a case of salmonella. We collected colostrum at birth. Each calf got colostrum from its dam, and then we bled the calves 24 to 48 hours later. This vaccine is approved in the United States for calves six months and older, I should say. So the results from this study, all 60 cows calved, colostrum was collected. One control group calf was born dead. <coughs> And two calves were born dead in the vaccinated group. There was no statistical significant difference between that. Two vaccinated uh, group cows had twins. So we ended up including all the calves in the study. So we wound up with 29 control calves and 30 vaccinated calves. These are ELISA SP or sample to positive ratios from this study. So you can see no difference in control group before calving or at calving. No difference here but the vaccinated group had a significant increase in titers. So these are the cows. So again, as we would expect, they've responded to vaccination, they've increased their titer. When we look at the colostrum of the cows that weren't vaccinated, as you would expect, we don't really see a high level of antibody titer there. We did see a significant increase in the antibody titer from the cows that had been vaccinated. And again, in the calves, we can see that they go from a very low antibody titer in the control group to a relatively high Salmonella Newport antibody titer when they were vaccinated. Second study we did, this was a, a similar study in design. This study was using a Behringer Ingelheim vaccine that's sold in the United States. The name of it is Intervene D. So this is a modified live oxytroph vaccine. So good luck with that word translators. But this is a mutant vaccine. It's basically designed, they knock out a gene that the bacteria needs for growth. So this is an aeromutant. So they knock out the ability of Salmonella Dublin to make aromatic amino acids like tyrosine or phenylalanine or tryptophan that the bacteria needs. So theoretically, it can never revert back to a virulent state. So modified live Salmonella Dublin vaccine. The big difference in this study was we actually vaccinated cows three weeks prior to dry off and then again at dry off. So instead of dry off and later, this was actually while they were still in lactation. Colostrum was collected at calving. Calves were fed colostrum from their dam within four hours of birth. In this study, we ran Salmonella Dublin titers using the Prionics ELISA for Salmonella Dublin, the Prio-Check ELISA that comes from uh, Denmark. No difference in milk production post-vaccination between groups in this study. So the Salmonella Dublin vaccine, uh, which is labeled for uh, cattle two weeks of age and older, so it would be labeled for cows as well in the United States didn't seem to cause any significant difference in or drop in milk. Again, we had a little bit of abortion. We had two calves born dead in the vaccinated group. One cow was aborted in the control group. 
no significant difference between those two. Um, we wound up with 29 calves in the vaccinated group and 30 control calves. Again, the numbers here are a little bit different. These ELISA it's numbers instead of SP ratios, this is percent positivity, which is just how the PrioCheck ELISA reports its data. So again, we see um, control group before vaccination and at calving very low. So these are negative numbers. They would be lower than the control. Uh, really no difference here. So they're not responding. Vaccinated group before calving was negative. And then again, they go up after at the time of calving or they're responding to vaccination. When we look at the colostrum, we didn't see a big of a, as big of an increase as we thought, but when we look at the calf data, we saw very significant increases uh, in these calves after they drank colostrum. Okay, in this study, we actually bled the calves right when they were born, just to ensure that there was no salmonella antibody transfer in, the, in utero, and you see, again, very negative numbers here, no antibodies present, but a very, very significant increase in these calves after they drink colostrum, okay? So, Many of you will say, okay, so what? The calves got vaccinated or the calves got antibodies. Is it going to work? Okay. We don't know that. We have an ongoing study where we're going to investigate this. But what we've shown so far <coughs> is that commercially available vaccines in the U.S. will work in that if I vaccinate the cow, I can see antibodies in the calves. We need to do more studies to figure out whether these are going to be protective my guess is that if they are protective, it's going to be for a relatively short duration, maybe a couple of months, but even that will be long enough that we can get these calves on a modified live vaccination program and hopefully have increased resistance to salmonella. So the study we have going on now will be with calves that receive colostrum from vaccinated versus non-vaccinated cows. They're going to get challenged with salmonella typhibarium about 10 days of age. We'll Hopefully this will be a more sophisticated study than just saying six out of 10 controls died versus only two out of 10 controls died. We're gonna look at clinical signs, blood cultures, fecal cultures, but we're also gonna look at gut barrier function by putting intestine on using chamber and seeing how much of the barrier function is still there. Hopefully look at numbers of salmonella in the gut using fluorescent in situ hybridization and hopefully do some pretty good stuff to figure out how much protection are we getting out of these vaccines. So with that, I uh, should be on time. I'd be happy to answer any questions that anybody has. Thanks very much, Jeff, for providing the details of those studies. If there are any questions from the audience, uh, we yep. have time for a few. Yes, um, for, your, yeah, for your future study, which vaccine do you use, the MLV or the... Currently, we're using the subunit vaccine. Hopefully, we, if, if this goes well, we can work with the other vaccine as well in the future. Question over here from this gentleman. I understand uh, this way is very effective, but I'm, I'm afraid that influence of endotoxin of salmonella vaccine. Uh, please tell me the inc incidence of the endotoxin, uh, except abortion or stillborn or uh, high degree, uh, high temperature of 40 degree uh, anorexia. Please. You understand what he's saying? <laughs> so could, could, I think you're, you're asking about- He said something uh, about endotoxin uh, with endotoxin salmonella, but I'm not positive yeah, what, yeah. what the question was. I, um, dried cow, for dried cow injection. Did, I think I'm, af I'm afraid. The, the, the impact of safety. Yeah. Safety. So obviously, these vaccines are actually both approved for the dry cows that they're being, um, whether there's a risk of abortion or not. Again, we didn't see a significant difference with a small number of cows. Perhaps we'd have to do larger studies to figure that out. Uh, we currently give other modified live vaccines in, in with, to dry cows in the U.S., so there's probably always a very small risk of abortion, but that's something I don't have data for. I certainly understand the concern. All right. Uh, Basically, what I said was I understand he's concerned about the risk of abortion associated with the use of an endotoxin-containing vaccine in the dry cows. We use other gram-negative vaccines in dry cows. There probably always is some risk, 
but to figure out how much risk there would be with salmonella, we'd have to do more studies. Both of these vaccines actually would be approved for dry cows in the U.S., so it's something that we can do legally. What the risk is, I don't know. Other questions? You got one over here? Uh, the interesting data from the literature, literature which, which you cited was about the use of uh, yolk immunoglobulins to uh, control the yes. uh, diarrheas. It will be not interesting to extend the utilization of uh, colostrum from the vaccinated cows and utilize the, the rests of the colostrum which uh, remains after calf feeding to add it to the uh, to the fat to the uh, milk replacer in, uh, given in, during the time of biggest yes. uh, danger yes? because salmonellosis i think the in calves happens in the age more than one week mostly yes so he's he's saying very interesting data with using egg yolk antibody what about the possibility of saving colostrum and trying to use that in calves with diarrhea there certainly is some data with rotavirus and cryptosporidium which are much more common causes of diarrhea that would suggest that's helpful we have a very small number of herds that would do that i guess we we have a problem sometimes in the u.s with herds having an adequate volume of colostrum just to feed their calves so a lot of herds would say we don't have enough quantity to save um, the problem with salmonella is typically we're not using a lot of salmonella vaccine, so there may not be much salmonella antibody in the colostrum. If we could use this research to show that by increasing salmonella antibodies, we have some protection, possibly saving some of that colostrum and then feeding it during time of an outbreak would be helpful. So, you know, I'm using salmonella vaccine to try to get antibodies in the colostrum, but potentially <laughs> Saving the colostrum, like you suggest, would be helpful as well, if this works. It may be that cell-mediated immunity is more important, but I think there's enough data in the literature to suggest that antibodies offer some protection to at least continue the research and see what we find. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. Um, our next speaker is Bob Sager. Uh, Bob is a nutritional consultant from uh, Montana. Uh, you may notice in the, uh, in, the, in, in the program that he has previously worked with the Miratorg Holdings in the Russian Federation Republic, uh, but recently he's moved back to Montana and we are very pleased to have him here in Dublin today. And he's going to talk about cobalt supplementation and the, um, the effect on human immunity. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, WC, WBC delegates. I'm proud and happy to be here. I thank the program committee for allowing me the opportunity to come to Ireland and to share my uh, trial with you today. You can see from this slide the tremendous change of beef production that has occurred in the United States in the last 100 years. The question I have to you as a group is with this tremendous change of phenotype and metabolism in production, do we actually need an increase of mineral requirements in today's cattle? Most, most of the recommendations in the United States are NRC um, recommendations from data that was derived in the 1950s and 60s. The objectives of the hypothesis of this trial was uh, to study a uh, test that uh, increased NRC levels of cobalt would definitely increase humoral immune response in pre-weaned beef calves, therefore decreasing bovine respiratory disease during the feedlot finishing period, and also to improve carcass characteristics. This slide shows that in any mineral deficiency, long before there's any normal growth and fertility differences, long before there's a maximum average daily gain and, and growth, the first thing to change is the uh, enzyme function, the immune status of the animal. We uh, recognize that much um, occurs in the subclinical cases before we actually see things clinically. Uh, nutrition supplementation during the pre-weaning phase 
has potential to reduce sickness. This has been shown over and over again. Nutritional management efforts to, uh, to minimize health problems affect production through life, definitely in the feeding uh, period. Sickness and decreased health have lasting effects on feedlot performance and definitely in carcass quality at slaughter. Uh, it's been recognized that uh, sickness during the feedlot period, uh, one uh, treatment sometimes reduces the yield grade by one, uh, one score level. Cobalt is required as an inner component for vitamin B12 in all animals. Cobalt is used, utilized by rumen gram nave anaerobic microbes uh, for the synthesis of vitamin B12. This is a molecule showing the nucleus of the cobalt uh, molecule in the vitamin B uh, molecule, one of the largest that occurs naturally in the body. Cattle obtain cobalt from forages according to the availability of cobalt in the soil. Specific geographical areas uh, require cobalt supplementation for normal beef production. I happen to practice in an area of southwest Montana, one hour driving a distance uh, north of Yellowstone Park, three and a half hours uh, south of Canadian Line in, in northwest United States. Uh, our um, beef production is high mountain um, valleys of 1,800 or more meters in altitude, and uh, we have a, a short growing season, uh, sometimes as, as short as uh, 80 days. Uh, we recognized uh, from years uh, of practice that we had uh, antagonistic uh, properties in both water and forage analysis that uh, created some uh, micro-mineral deficiency problems, particularly in copper, because of the amount of uh, iron in the soil and the molybdenum content also. But when we recognized these and we uh, supplemented um, our beef cattle rations and doing custom mineral uh, programs, we noticed that even in spite of this, we had some of the lowest levels of cobalt ever recorded in liver biopsies. Um, iron, as I've shared with you, is uh, the most important antagonistic uh, pr uh, mineral in our uh, geographical area. Uh, also, with deficiency and ad additional stress, uh, it also is an added effect on sickness and disease. Um, interactions of antagonists uh, definitely uh, cause um, increase of BRD and sickness. Uh, the the viral, uh, uh, viral components initiated, but the most common are the bacterial uh, problems. Vitamin B12 is absorbed from the ileum as a vital cofactor in specific metabolic enzymes of lipid and carbohydrate energy metabolism in the bovine. You can see um, a biochemical reaction here, particularly in the appropriate metabolism. But we also recognize that vitamin B12 is a vital component for DNA synthesis of B cells to proliferate to form plasma cells that produce antibodies within the bovine. Differences in microminerals intake and absorption and metabolism in beef cattle often determine the response to infection. Both um, weaning and transportation at stresses in our area, calves that are born late February, March um, are on summer pasture and in the mountains during the um, nursing period and are, are usually weaned and shipped the same day to feedlots in, um, in Nebraska and uh, the um, Midwest. These all have negative additive effects on the immune response of the individual animal. BRD, of course, is one of the most challenging factors that we occur with beef production in the United States as in the world, and BRD causes 25% of all calf deaths. Complex disease involving, as you know, uh, viral, bacterial, and stress factors, and by far the most serious in our area is the manhemia hemolytica problem is one of the, one of the most challenging things we have to deal with. It's common that in uh, pre-weaning programs that we include uh, manhemia uh, in our vaccination protocol. Uh, 
The manhemia organism is particularly uh, serious because of the leukotoxin effect that destroys the macrophages and neutrophils of the normal immune response, and also the tissue uh, inflammatory response that occurs because of the release of the granules of uh, peroxide and, and, uh, and uh, chlorine that are released from the granules of the macrophages in the tissues that are very reactive. This, this uh, uh, demonstration or this slide actually shows a, a, all the factors in, that are involved in the pre-weaning um, and post-weaning uh, stress factors in the uh, bovine calf. A BRD uh, is responsible for uh, one per, 0.4% of the feedlot cattle perish before harvest weight in the United States, and that actually more cattle die of BRD than any, any other factor, and all factors combined. Uh, pathologically, there's a tremendous uh, immune, uh, immune reaction that occurs in the normal tissue of the lungs, and most of this is permanent. That affects the uh, performance during the feedlot period. My research study today that I would like to share with you is on the element cobalt. The approach design, I tried to design this so that I reduced as many variables as I possibly could. I had a unique situation in my area where I had uh, five cow herds that were owned by brothers and cousins. Uh, the, the, um, the genetics were almost identical. Uh, cattle were raised on the same forage and aquifer uh, within a 20-mile uh, radius. They were all in the same health program. They were um, vaccinated uh, uh, pre-weaning uh, uh, entirely in a 10-day pe period of time. They were weaned and shipped to the same feedlot at the same period of time. Uh, so out of the 2,000 head of calves, I chose to, to uh, use 100 for treatment, and these were given a 30-gram 30, 30 uh, cobalt oxide bolus that was um, obtained from um, Australia. And these were given uh, this bolus uh, orally at, uh, at uh, vaccination time approximately three weeks before weaning. Uh, blood was collected for initial manhemia hemolytic leukotoxin antibodies. This shows the demographics of the area that I practice in. And also at that same time, 100 calves were bled and not treated with cobalt uh, bolus. This is a picture showing this um, metal bolus. It has a, a charcoal surface on the outside, a sustain release cobalt additive underneath. <clears throat> At the same time, calves were vaccinated with uh, Manhemia hemolytica at the time of, uh, of treatment. By, uh, and also, the calves originated, as I shared uh, with you, from uh, genetically the same type of program, uh, almost uh, identical uh, growing period, and they were shipped to the same and fed at the same feedlot and harvested over a three-week period of time. <clears throat> Antibody uh, levels for manhemia leukotoxin were uh, collected at day one at treatment and then at day 70 at the feedlot. Uh, response to manhemia hemolyticos was analyzed by a Wells 2T uh, test, and differences uh, were significant with p-value of less than uh, 0 0.05. I'd like to share with you my results. Um, the treatment uh, group, as you see, uh, had a 43% increase in uh, manhemia uh, hemolytic leukotoxin antibodies compared to the control group. Um, dramatically, the instance of clinical BRD was about 81% less in the treatment group versus the control group. And uh, importantly, uh, heart carcass, hot carcass weights were 17.8 kilograms heavier in the treatment group versus control group, which uh, um, shows that uh, the p-values were statistically sound in this um, um, trial, and that co cobalt-treated uh, calves had a decreased uh, BRD, which is very significant during the period of, of feeding. The important economical thing was that cobalt-treated calves had a heart carcass uh, weight of uh, 17.8 kilograms, which 
actually returned a $90.31 return for a $3 investment. A discussion of RUTs uh, results, if I had to do this again, um, information that I obtained from Dr. Conford, Oklahoma State University has indicated the half-life of the uh, leukotoxin antibody is about 60 days. Because of weather conditions, uh, I was uh, delayed and I did not get the um, second uh, uh, bleeding done until day 70. Had I had an opportunity to do this within the 60 days, I believe I would have had better, uh, uh, better success. Also, the, the uh, clinical evaluation of the calves in the feedlot was done by two different individuals that lived at the feedlot. This could have been, um, I think, improved if I had the same person doing it. And then that we uh, could always could in, increase the number of, uh, of, uh, of experimental units in, these, in the study. Uh, implications, in, I'm, in my opinion, is that this is relevant to the beef cattle uh, people, uh, producers around the world, because of increase in profitability in, in beef calf production. And that also, this may be a novel fit for a nutritional approach to improve efficiency in beef cattle production medicine instead of using feed grade antibiotics and things like this. And as you know, in, uh, in the future, there's gonna be a increased pressure uh, of using antimicrobials. And I think this has a potential um, future of using a nutritional approach to uh, increase efficiency and decrease, excuse me, decrease. I'd like to acknowledge uh, particularly the cattle producers in my area for allowing me the opportunity to use their animals. This was done um, outside the academic or university environment in, in a practical approach. I'd also like to thank my father for inducing me to uh, opportunity to be, uh, be a beef cattle producer while growing off the family ranch. And uh, I'd like to thank also my fellow uh, graduate students that helped me during the project. Um, up to this time, I would welcome uh, uh, any questions you might uh, have at, uh, at this time. Um, be happy to try to entertain those. And also, this is what I'm going to do when I get back home. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bob. Looks very nice. Okay. Uh, we, we have time for one quick question, if there's any from the audience. This lady over here. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Um, did you ever measure cobalt levels or B12, which I don't think is as good, but cobalt at any point? Um, as, as far as uh, liver biopsies, n not on these, not on these uh, experimental unit cattle. Uh, our main objective, as I shared with you, the apostles was directly to see a change in the humoral antibody. I have done numerous uh, cobalt uh, biopsies in my practice area. I might, I might uh, very briefly tell you that this all started 15 years ago when I had uh, some vaccine failure problems in some very, very well managed beef production units. Uh, our, our production units vary from 300, 300 cow sized up to 3,000 cow sized. Uh, and we did, we did recognize even with uh, uh, copper supplementation, we still had tremendous low cobalt levels, and this was primarily, I believe, due to the interference of iron in the, in the water supply. And some of the biopsy results that were done at Michigan State were some of the lowest that they have ever recorded uh, back uh, at that laboratory. Thank you for your question. Thank you very much, All Bob, right. for a very Thanks. interesting discussion. Thank you.